There's a dull, nondescript building, really quite ugly building in Washington, D.C. And if, I know from experience that if you go there on a Sunday afternoon and stand on the steps, the entrance, and start interviewing somebody without telling anyone, a voice comes from nowhere and says, please remove yourself from this property. And if you don't, and you continue as I did, then it repeats itself and gets a bit louder and a bit more aggressive. Please remove yourself from this building. And it's not so anything exciting. It's not the CIA or anything like that. It's just an ordinary government office building. But in November 2008, it was the home of the Obama presidency in waiting. And led by the former chief of staff from the Clinton years, they were carving out what was going to be the policies of the Obama era, including, of course, Guantanamo Bay. And under un understandably, they brought in the experts, and they brought in a guy called Ken Goode, who had spent years in Washington basically writing about Guantanamo and working out how you go about closing the detention camp there. And he suggested three main things. First of all, that there should be an immediate announcement to make it clear that this was a new era, the Bush, the Bush era was gone, and this was the start. Times were changing. And on, well, a year ago today, uh, President Obama was sworn in, and two days later, he did exactly that. He announced that Guantanamo was going to, cl to close. He, he listened. The second suggestion, suggestion was that a lot of work had been done in working out what to do, how to close the detention camp. So there was no point in setting out on a long, drawn-out process to come, with a, come up with a plan. You might as well just start on day one and say, right, this is the plan, this is how we are going to do it. Well, as of this day, there are politicians on Capitol Hill who are still saying they are waiting for the plan. And what they say we got instead was a long, drawn-out process to come up with a plan. And the third thing that Ken Goode suggested was that it wasn't going to be easy closing Guantanamo. It was going to be really difficult. So allow yourself enough time. Set an 18-month deadline. Well, as you all know, a year ago on, on Friday, President Obama set a 12-month deadline. He has admitted that that is not going to be met. And as of this moment, we don't know when the detention camp is going to close. And there are some people who are suggesting it won't happen at all. And as of tonight, there are 198 detainees still in Guantanamo. And the man on my right, has, whilst they have perhaps been fighting to get out, he was fighting to get into Guantanamo in order to get them out. He endured... I should say, he's got form. He'd been told to get out of Guantanamo himself a few times for, uh, for <laughs> might, violating the rules. That's another we story. We might come, come to that later. Mm -hmm. but. He endured plane journeys on a tiny aeroplane, which took about four hours, where there were the only toilets, I'm told, were w empty water bottles. And, and I'm told that there's no truth in the rumor that he, he, uh, he relabeled some of those bottles with the word lemonade. There is no and, truth And they in ended that. up on the Guantanamo if, commander's desk. No, if, no? no, there's no truth in that. But there is truth in this story, which is uh, Air Sunshine, which um, one of the guys who was running the military justice, and I use that word loosely, uh, process in Guantanamo, told me that when he flew Air Sunshine, his life insurance company jacked up his policy by $100 a, a, a month. But to a year. But the, I was flying it. The, there is no toilet on Air Sunshine, actually. And I was with a very young American soldier one time. And I told them as they took off, they give you these complimentary fizzy drinks. I said, don't be suckered by that. Don't take them. It's a long flight. There's no toilet. And he wouldn't listen to me. I was a communist lawyer. And so uh, he drank it at the beginning. And around about two and a half hours into the flight, he finally had to put it back into the can, not the bottle that he'd taken it from. And it was very embarrassing for him. That is the only truth to that, but that is true. But there is truth in the rumor, the story that um, Clive was detained at one stage by the intelligence agencies in Jordan and questioned. And there's also some truth in the story that he was almost arrested in Guantanamo for conspiracy to murder an iguana. 
So please that welcome. Was, no, that wasn't a serious one. The serious one that I got threatened with banging up with was conspiracy to smuggle Speedo swimming trunks and Under Armour underpants into Shakaran. That was the serious one. Well, you were one. almost arrested for well, that too, but running over an iguana. I had a deal with, well, I wasn't driving, but I had a deal with my wife that, uh, and it was intimidating actually, compared to Jordan, where I was taken in by the secret police, but that wasn't as intimidating as Guantanamo where I had to deal with them that if I didn't send her an email or a call each night mentioning the name of our dog Melpamine, she was to call my legal team. Because, you know, there have been five times that, uh, that they threatened to uh, bang me up there. And it was intimidating, I'll agree. It wasn't funny at the time. It was funny later, though. The, uh, the, the Under Armour story, can I just tell you that very quickly? It's got nothing to do with tonight, but I just enjoy it. Um, I get this letter uh, saying that I smuggled Under Armour underpants and, and, and Speedo swimming trunks. There are some Australians in the audience. We can agree that wearing Speedo swimming trunks designed by an Australian is a criminal offence. Um, <laughs> but, but in that, I, I get this letter saying that I'd smuggled these into Shaka and he was wearing both the Under Armour underpants and the Speedo swimming trunks at the same time. <laughs> I got this. My wife has a very sensible policy, which is that when I get letters like this, she unplugs the internet. So I can't send a letter out immediately <laughs> telling these people what I think. So I composed this letter, which I thought was quite funny. And it was all about the Australians and Speedo swimming trunks. And by the way, the only place that Shaka could actually swim in his cell in Guantanamo would be to dive into the toilet. So if you, the simple expedient, you know, the free legal advice was that if you put a sign up saying, um, we don't piss in your swimming pool, so please don't swim in our toilet, that should solve the whole problem. And then there was a whole thing about Under Armour underpants and so forth, whatever. Um, and I couldn't send it because Em had unplugged the internet, goddammit. So the next morning when I woke up in a slightly different frame of mind, I read it over and sent it anyhow, and, uh, and to the Times and the Post, who published it. And boy, did that make the people in Guantanamo angry. I mean, it was ridiculous. I mean, apart from anything else, why shouldn't Shaka have Under Armour underpants if that's what he's got? But my policy is to work on legal briefs, not the other sort of briefs. <laughs> and, uh, and it went on and on, and it was actually tremendous fun. And I'm very glad to say that Agent Provocateur came out uh, as a result of this with a line of orange underpants that said, fair trial my ass across the back. <laughs> and, and Lush came out with some of those bath ballistics that you'd put in your bath and they'd fizz, and out would pop a picture of Binyam Mohammed or Samuel Hajj. My wife dubbed those buy one, set one free, which <laughs> I thought was a, and we had this wonderful little thing over that, which was very funny later. It actually wasn't very funny at the time, but whatever. What the hell? Sorry. I, excuse me for interrupting. No, no, I, I, I was going to say, welcome Clive Stafford Smith and get everybody to applaud you. Oh, there you go. All right, all right. <laughs> Now, we are going to talk about the last year and about what has happened and what has happened, but I think you, you, you've attracted a sell out audience here, Clive. So let's just talk about yourself just for a few moments. I mean, people here will remember you before the Grand Tanamo days as the man who was defending people on death row. So when and, and why did he suddenly decide, right, I'm going to spend the next however many years on the Grand Tanamo issue? Well, um, I mean, we still do a lot of death penalty work. And you may have seen the tragic case of Akmal Sheikh from China over the holidays, which was a, a very tragic um, case. My dad was bipolar, and so was Akmal. But um, for 20 years before Guantanamo, I'd been representing people in the Deep South. And, and I remember the day that, um, that they announced Guantanamo Bay. And you know, there's a set. Um, profile, if you will, of the people on, on death row and, and how we sort of distill our hatred towards these people so much that at some level we, you know, we want to take them out and the state wants to kill them. And you know, I've been there when six of my guys have died. And you know, it is an extraordinary uh, human experience to be in a room where the state of Georgia or Mississippi or whatever wants to kill an individual because somehow that's going to make the world a better place. But when they um, announced the policy in the name of the rule of law and democracy and all that of establishing a prison in Cuba um, where we would hold people beyond the rule of law, and this was 
in the early days, we'd already heard some rumors, but in the early days of 2001, that was just so hypocritical. Um, that yeah, it because it, it opened on, I think, January the 11th, yeah. 2002. So when did you first find well, out that this was something They that publicly announced it only on the 8th, but yeah. we'd heard some rumors before that. And, and, and I, I just thought it was ridiculous. And, and I thought, well, all my death penalty mates will want to sue the hell out of George Bush. What could be more fun? So I started crawling around on the day that they announced it, saying, you know, who's up for this? And I totally misjudged the, you know, I'm a, I've got an American passport. And how many people are American here? And you must remember, I mean, it was an immensely emotional thing. And, uh, you know, in large part, I think, because the US has not suffered in the way that other countries have with invasion in, in, in many ways. But I had misjudged that totally in the sense that I thought, how can anyone not want to sue over this? This is outrageous. But I called around my death penalty friends, and it was a very, you know, most of them just sort of hummed and hard and said they had other things to do. And it was actually only a couple of people, Joe Margulis and then uh, Center for Constitutional Rights, Mike Ratner, who thought that we should get on and do it. And we did. We ended up suing them on February the 19th, 2002. It's, it's um, not something where you can just pick up the phone and say, Binyam Muhammad, I'm a lawyer, can I represent you? So how did he go about it? Well, I mean, you know, this was something that we do have experience in the death penalty area of, is when you have, some, you have no uh, client who can't give you permission or won't give you permission, I mean, you're dealing, for example, uh, I spent eight years with Larry Loncha, who was like Akmal Sheikh, he was bipolar. And Larry, every time he'd get depressed, the state of Georgia and its infinite wisdom would refuse to give him medication because they knew that if he got really depressed, he'd drop his appeals and then they could kill him. And when he would drop his appeals, he'd always fire me and uh, then we'd get into this whole issue of how could we represent him and you had to do it through a next friend. So you had to get someone who was his family member to represent him saying that he was incompetent to make the decision. And we did that several times. Four times in Larry's case, we came within 40 minutes of his execution. One time we came within 58 seconds. I was on the phone to the clerk of the Supreme Court in Washington saying, you know, when are we going to hear from you people? And he said, you know, can you give me a minute? And I said, no, we don't have a minute. And it was at that point that the Supreme Court ruled eight to one that he should have uh, a hearing and stayed it. And so we had this whole process that you would go through with prisoners who had no access to, uh, to, to court effectively, either through their own incompetency or through, through the fact that they were locked up somehow, that they couldn't get access to a lawyer. So that was the way. I mean, the reason that the, the first plaintiffs in Guantanamo were British was simply because they were the first people we could identify and find family members of, uh, of people so we could sue. So, the so you went three. through the family members first, and well, then actually through Gareth Pierce was the one who got them for us because yeah. we had a, a link with that. And the second group was was Australian because they were the second lot we could get to. And Gareth Pierce, of course, is a well-known human rights lawyer um, in uh, in London who right. represented the Birmingham Six. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so when was the first time you actually got into Guantanamo? Well, it took two and a half years to, to get the Supreme Court to recognize the rights. You know, the, the first two courts said no, that there was absolutely no way. The, how, the, the rest of you who are not American, we can bond, you know, those of us who are American. Those of you who are not uh, have no rights at all, right? This is where the iguanas come into it, actually, in reality. Because our argument was that because the environmental laws applied to Guantanamo, um, if I kick an iguana as an American, I get 10 years in prison, $10,000 fine. If I kick you as a Welsh person, then that's fine. I can do that, and, you, and there's no consequences. And so we were arguing for equal rights with iguanas, just because you can't take these people too seriously. If you take them seriously, then they argue seriously about these absurd notions that you as foreigners, or foreigners, I think, we, how, how would you pronounce that? No, you no, no, you're not a real southerner. <laughs> the, um, the, where are you from then? New York. Ah, Georgia. God, Georgia. Well, you can pronounce. No, she's Georgia. Oh, right. She's faking the accent. <laughs> the uh, foreigner. You're a foreigner, and you people have no rights at all. And so, you know, you can either have that argument, which is an interesting one. This is the way it goes. The U.S. Constitution is a compact between us and our government, and you're not us, so you don't enter that compact. So the U.S. Constitution doesn't apply to you if you're not in America. 
Human rights law, the US government, interestingly, um, has signed not one human rights law that's enforceable against the United States. Something we'll live to regret uh, when we're no longer number one if we don't wake up pretty soon. Uh, so consequently, as human beings, you have no human rights. They're not enforceable. As foreigners, you have no constitutional rights. So the logical argument is that you have no rights at all. And that was the argument that the government was making. And that was the argument that prevailed in the district court and the court of appeals. And we won 6-3 in the Supreme Court in June 2004, after two and a half years. And got that, in, that's got in for the first time and then those, those um, plane journeys began. Again, well, yes. Mm. Well, well, let's have a look at the last year. As I say, it was a year ago today. Can I preface this by saying that I feel utterly incompetent? I mean, look, I should say this. <laughs> Any criticisms one has of Obama, I voted for him. I think he's a decent human being. If I ran America, I'd screw it up a lot worse than him. So I just want to preface any comments we have with that. When he announced on the 22nd of January last year that Guantanamo was to close within a year, we, we spoke, speak quite often, but I can't remember whether I phoned you that day or uh, that week. Did, what was your reaction? Did you think it was going to happen? Well, let me tell you about two reactions. The first reaction was the reaction of the funders of our charity, Reprieve, who called up the same day or the day after saying, why do we need to fund you anymore? This is all over. You know, we have a wonderful new president. It doesn't need to be done anymore. I was a bit skeptical about that. Um, but on the other hand, look, it was wonderful, wasn't it? What a brave new day when suddenly you didn't have George Bush with this apologia for the horrors that we've been through. I mean, I got to say, I went to law school in New York um, in the early 80s, and it never occurred to me that I would sit across a table from uh, another human being, in this case the most extreme was Benyam Mohammed, and talk to him for three days about how people from my country had uh, taken a razor blade to his genitals or at least had made that happen or had tortured him over the space of five years. I mean, it never occurred to me that that would be a part of the debate. And after seven years of that discussion with George Bush, what a relief to have uh, Barack Obama. And you've read, um, I hope, uh, his first book, Dreams from My Father. And you know, you read that, and I think you see the human being, even if you don't see the politician, and you know where he's from. And so what a, what a wonderful change. I, I've never read a biography of George Bush. I probably won't. But I can't imagine it would say quite the same things. But, but you knew the Guantanamo story probably more than anybody when he said that it would close no later than a year from now, which is what he said. Did, did you think, yeah, sure, or did you really think that, that would happen? No, I thought it would absolutely happen, and it could happen. And this is one place I would have screwed up the economy, I would have screwed up everything else, but I'd have closed Guantanamo in a year quite easily. And it wasn't that difficult. Um, the, you know, you said, but but, but it, you say it wasn't that difficult, but... I was merely going to quote myself. In but, but, but a lot of people fantastic was going to quote yourself there. No, 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 no. I, 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 fortunately, you can go back and read it. I said how to do it. I laid out the map. And it's not that there weren't problems, but it was, it was quite obvious what you needed to do. There were three groups of people that we had to deal with. The, the easy group with the vast majority, which are the people we can just send home. The overwhelming majority of those were Yemenis. And you know, if you think of Yemen, gross, you know, per capita national income each year of $300, roughly 100 Yemenis, if you gave them $3 million to just take them home, you could have upped their standard of living for goodness knows how long. You would have made friends of all of them after we'd abused them. It would have been really easy. And we spent a lot more than that keeping them in Guantanamo for the last year. So that group was easy. Shipping way over half of these prisoners back home was simple. It could have been done quickly, and it wouldn't have uh, caused many problems, I don't think, other than what we got already. Second group was, gonna, was the ones we wanted to try. Not so difficult. You do what he said he's going to do. You take him to America. You've got to figure out what prison to hold him in. Then you put him on trial, and you know there you go. Not so hard. The mythology that we have to have a different system than what we call an Article Three court, as in a real civilian court, is ridiculous. Um, and there's only one reason for that. The only reason you don't want to have a real court is to cover up your own problems. And I hope we'll talk tonight 
about the real issue for the last years, which is secrecy. Not torture, not this other stuff, but secrecy. That's by far the worst legacy of, of the Bush era. Um, and that's the only, you know, think about KSM, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, supposedly the guy who committed the big, biggest crime involved in this. Can we try him in a real court? Yeah. He went on Al Jazeera and boasted that he was behind 9-11. He wasn't being waterboarded then. Perfectly possible to present his case in court. The only reason you're a little nervous about doing it is he's going to then say, I was actually later waterboarded 183 times. That's embarrassment. That doesn't prevent you from, from presenting the case. So that second group was quite easy. The third group was the tough one. It was always going to be the tough one. And I'm extremely pleased that most of my prognoses were totally wrong. But this one was right, um, which is that's the hard group. Where do we take the refugees? The people who, we, who were minding their own business, by and large, in Pakistan, and who were refugees, couldn't go back to Libya, to Algeria, to places like that. We had to find another place to take them. And that required the Europeans to step up and other countries like Doha, like Qatar, who would have taken them all. But it took some work. And if, if Obama had capitalized on his immense popularity to do that, and I, I, I've spent many times, I've been to Do Doha three times, the Qataris would have taken them all if only the Americans hadn't been so rude to them. And the Americans, and I can say this perfectly openly, I mean, I'm not quoting them. I'm saying what my opinion is, although I suspect it's somewhat close to theirs, um, that the Americans won't be nice to the Qataris because they support, they talk to Hamas, and they talk to the Iranians as the Middle Eastern power brokers. Well, of course, they do. Everyone should talk to them. Even Obama says we should talk to them. But if we had treated them nicely, instead of doing what we actually did, public knowledge that when um, a uh, senior minister from Qatar met with, um, with what's her face, Hillary Clinton. Uh, instead of being nice to him, she refused to have pictures taken with him after the meeting because they were annoyed that, that Qatar was talking to Hamas and thereby offended them. If we hadn't done petty, stupid things like that, Qatar would have taken everybody that was needed to be taken. And that could still happen if we just grow up and act like human beings. So that could have been solved quite easily. It wasn't. I think for the reasons that you identified, John, which was faffing around over pr process. Well, yeah, well, let, let, let's get, come to that. But I mean, <coughs> by the sounds of things, if we'd had President St Stafford Smith as, as opposed to right, President Obama, it would have been else. closed within 48 hours. It and is though, slightly it improbable tonight, that but... I would have been elected <laughs> largely because I was born in Britain. <laughs> but, um, but, it, but. No, I think that's surely the <laughs> only, that's reason. The only I mean, reason. They would clearly have elected me otherwise. <laughs> But, but it wasn't as straightforward as that, was that? Was it? Because I mean, you, as you say, you, you had those groups, you had the prisoners who, who could be released, but you had to find somewhere other than Qatar to, to, to send them. Um, you had to find somewhere in the United States where you were going to keep the, pres the, the prisoners who were gonna, weren't going to be released. And then let's talk about the, the Yemen problem, because as you say, there, there, were, there were 98 prisoners from Yemen at the beginning. There were more people from Yemen than from any other country. And if it, people didn't know about the Yemen issue after what happened over Christmas and into the new year, we certainly do now because um, of the insecure situation in Yemen. And this is, I know, is something that has kept officials in the Obama administration up at night. You can't, they were, they've been absolutely determined, you can't just send people en masse back to Yemen because to quote one person, uh, I know he said to me that to do so, potentially you would be sending them straight back into the arms, the welcoming arms of Al Qaeda. So no, no, to do so would mean you'd lose the election in Massachusetts. Let's talk about the reality of this. But the, the, the reality is that there is an unstable situation in Yemen. Well, yeah, I've been to Yemen three times on this, and you know, look, this is this is the real issue, and I think it's very important in England too. I, I don't know how you feel about it, but. It strikes me as profoundly uh, ironic, well, that's not the right word, bizarre, that the Labour government in Britain has its policy driven by the Daily Mail. I mean, isn't that fascinating, right? I mean, we, we, do, we deal with that a lot. I mean, as you know, we're not stupid as a charity. We spend a lot of time getting stories in the Daily Mail because it terrifies the living daylights out of uh, the government. 
Why would uh, supposedly, and I was interested by the comments in the Chilcot uh, inquiry about people being good socialists, but why would a good socialist government run its agenda according to the criticism of the Daily Mail? It's insanity, right? And the same is true in America. I mean, my, I, I, I admire Obama. I think he's got many, many good facets. But the problem he has is that he's a consensus builder, and you cannot build a consensus with lunatics. You know, if someone says to you that the NHS is actually a way to funnel old people into death, then you're not going to get a rational conversation with them. My wife has this lovely policy now with all our American friends who visit. She makes them go to um, you know, Maiden Castle and all these lovely things and the Dorchester Hospital because she wants them to see the Dorchester Hospital and go home with the view that I certainly have, which is you people who live in this country are incredibly lucky. Um, but your problem when you're Obama is once you start trying to reach a consensus with people in the Republican Party whose job is to make your life miserable and who really believe some of these crazy things. I was doing this thing on Newsnight the other night with some crazy guy from the, um, who was part of, I didn't want to make any snide comments about him on TV, but he was the, uh, he was counsel or counselor to the, the Osama bin Laden search team. And I thought that's prima facie evidence. He doesn't know what he's about, but anyway, <laughs> The, um, he was going on about how we are at war with 80% of, uh, of Muslims. This is what got us into this mess. These people are on the wrong planet. And you can't possibly expect to achieve a sensible outcome if you're trying to negotiate to reach a consensus with them. And that's the problem with, that Obama's faced, is he's tried to do that. And you admire his optimism, but he's crazy. And the same is true, of course, you know, in a similar fashion with the Labour Party. If they want to reach a consensus with the Daily Mail, they're not going to do it. Well, so well, why don't you stick to your principles? I mean, the consensus build building caused problems at Congress, and we'll come to that. But you, you've sort of skirted around Yemen. Because well, look, Yemen, that's easy. You, you I mean, would just, just send them back to Yemen? Of and course no I would. I know those people. I've met a lot of them. I've represented a bunch of them. Take Samir Mukbel. You know, is this guy going to go around committing terrorist acts in the future? He never did. He's been cleared by them for ages. He's a farmer from Yemen. If you gave him 500 bucks a year for the next 10 years, he'd be the happiest person in the world. You know, our problem as Americans has been this. And on September the 12th, 2001, we had a reservoir of goodwill, the like of which America has never known. And we had the we, people wanted to help us out. They were on our side. They knew we were victims. And we pissed that away. And we're now hated in ways that America never has. How's that come about? It's because we didn't stand by our principles. We instead um, were, were willing to indulge in, in this war on terror, or war of terror, as Borat calls it, uh, language that's caused us immense trouble. And Obama's problem is he's adopted some of that language. He got rid of the war on terror language, but he's adopted so much of the language that the Republicans were using about how these people are all very dangerous. Our biggest problem trying to find European countries to take refugees is when we go to them and say, you know, I know um, Yusuf, for example, Mohammed El Gharani, he's 14 at the time the Americans seized him, he's no more a terrorist than my grandmother. Um, and the Pentagon then says, oh, no, no, he was 28. He was a member of the London cell of Al Qaeda. Well, that makes it very hard for European countries to take Yusuf. Now, we proved that he actually was 14 and that they'd never bothered to get his birth certificate. We proved, as the judge said when we finally got a hearing, that he couldn't possibly be a member of the London cell of Al Qaeda because he'd never been to London. Um, and, you know, the problem for Obama was the Pentagon was still briefing everybody on this nonsense, as with the, uh, how many people here think that 70 people, 14% of Guantanamo have gone back to the battlefield? Put your hand up. How many people have qualms about it? Because you know, you're not going to put your hand up because I'll pick on you. <laughs> Come on, be honest. Some of you think there's a number. Yeah, tell me, ma'am. What do you? Can, can, can we have the microphone? Yeah, the rumor is out there. Let me repeat what you said. The rumor is out there, so you believe it whether it's true or not. If you're Obama and you're trying to resolve your problem of Guantanamo Bay, having that rumor out there is very, very damaging. So you only want it out there if it's true. Why do you let the Pentagon say that 
if, in legal parlance, it's bullshit. Well, um, let, let's, yeah. let's, let's be fair, okay. Kai, because, because as you know, you know, I've spent time with the guy who's, who's in charge of the, that there's a task force. One of the, the processes that was set up a year ago was that several task forces set about working on different parts of the Grand Tanamo policy. And one of the task forces was in charge of going through all the uh, prisoners in Grand Tanamo one by one. Um, one of their problems was actually trying to get all the case files from them because uh, they were scattered about all over the place. But once they'd done that, the, the, the idea that the, the 60 attorneys and analysts were going through all, all the, the case files and they were working out what to do with all of these individuals and the, the choices which perhaps we'll talk about was whether to release them, to put them on trial or hold them under the wars of law. But let's talk about that, about that in a moment. Um, the wars of war. Let, 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 let's, let's talk about that in, in a moment. But um, the wars of law are a very but, different but, thing. It's when we. But, we, but, but, uh, but I know that um, I know that the the guy in charge of the task force, his, his big concern was was that what would happen if some of these individuals were to end up in attacks which cost American lives. And you talk about those figures released by the Pentagon. Um, they were misused and misquoted in, in an article in the New York Times, but the actual figures said that 27 of the individuals who were released by the Bush administration, so about 5%, um, about according to the Pentagon, had been involved in terrorism. And one can argue about those individuals, but we, we know, for example, two of them for sure um, were released in 2006 and 2007 to Saudi Arabia and are now involved in Al Qaeda in Yemen. And how do we know that? Not because the Pentagon told, tells us, because they, those two individuals, appeared on videos which were posted on the mm. internet saying, We are in Al Qaeda in Yemen. So, sure. mm. so, so, so you can't just dismiss it. No, you wouldn't dismiss it all. Uh, you wouldn't, but you've got two things here, two separate issues, right? One is, you know, yes, of course, there are people who have been involved in being really pissed off at America and, you know, been involved in violence against America since Guantanamo Bay. And that's, of course, that's true. And if you think about prison and the recidivism rate of the average prison, which is normally about 50% in America, you'd think, wow, it should be a lot more than, than 5%. It would be a lot more than that in a regular prison. Of course, there are going to be those people. In, what you have to think about first in that context is the argument that's currently been made by the apologists for Guantanamo. And it goes like this, and it was said the other night on TV, and it's remarkable, isn't it? And it is that we have treated these people badly, we've held them in Guantanamo for so long, we've angered them so much that they now hate us, so we can't afford to let them go. <laughs> now, that's the argument. I mean, it really is. And it's remarkable, isn't it? I mean, you've got to accept that it's true on one level, that, of course, we have pissed people off so much. And what you have to think to yourself is, is the world that we live in, the Alice in Wonderland world, that we can, we can mistreat people and then say, well, we'd better never let them go because they're, they're angry at us and they'll, they'll do us harm. Uh, and obviously, I think any sane person would say, no, we can't take that position. We just can't. But then the question is, how do you solve that? How do you solve that? Do you solve that by saying, we're going to carry on doing the things that have aggravated these folks? Or do you solve that by the simple expedient of saying, I'm sorry? Um, and you know, I, I found it fascinating. When I go around the world in the Middle East, and I, I've got a British passport and an American passport, so I, and my wife's Australian, so I can say, I apologize for all these people. I apologize for Bush. I apologize for Blair. I'm really sorry. You know, the response to that is amazing. It really is. The, you know, people are very, very forgiving when you say, I'm sorry. Now, you know, you can say politically, is it realistic to expect politicians to say, I'm sorry? Well, damn right it is, quite frankly. Um, and that's the first thing we've got to do before we expect to solve our problems, is we've got to accept that we made mistakes. We can't just pretend that everything's still fine. And so you're right, John, that of course there are going to be problems. The question is, how do we solve those problems? And we don't solve those problems by perpetuating the inequity. But the difficulty is that whilst Clive Stafford-Smith will always believe that the risk that some of these individuals, 5% or, or, or more or less, might end up being released and then ending up involved in attacks which cost lives, 
It's one thing convincing you, it's another thing the American public, because the, the, the thing that perhaps gets lost in the coverage of this story is, whereas it'd be interesting, to, you've had a straw poll, let's have a straw poll here. How many people here would like to see Guantanamo closed? The oh, no, there's no one left to pick on. <laughs> and, 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 and how many would like to see it remain open? Now, if we were in... It's no fun, you know. If, if we were in America, in, in, you know. <laughs> OK, good. Thank God. Let's hear from you. I'd like to see it remain open. I think it will draw attention to the fact that I know you're a fan of I'd like to see it remain open, just so it will remain as an open, festering sore on the face of Western democracy. <laughs> So and would hopefully not good, not okay. good right show Barack reason. Obama for what he is, which is a man who's, I think, not kept one election promise, hmm. including keeping warrantless wiretapping, voting to re, uh, keep the Patriot Act, etc., etc., etc. Because the interesting thing is, if, if we were in many parts of America, as our um, U.S. guests here, to, guests tonight would, would verify, we would have had a completely different reaction because a recent poll, a, a Gallup poll... No, you in wouldn't because we'd have made it clear where we come from <laughs> and we'd have been nasty, intimidating people. But, but a, anyway. a, a Gallup poll in November um, 2009 showed that two-thirds of those who were questioned, um, I think across the states, um, wanted Guantanamo to remain open and were opposed to the idea of any Guantanamo prisoners coming to the states. And, and, and that's probably, the, wouldn't you agree, the biggest hurdle of all, a US public opinion. Because you mentioned Congress. It wasn't just, you mentioned the Republicans, in, in not very flattering terms. But um, it, it, remember, President Obama had majorities in both houses of Congress. He had Congress on his side, in theory. But his own party, Democrat politicians, were voting against closing Guantanamo. They were voting against the funding for the closure of Guantanamo, and that was because they feared losing their seats. Well, but with due respect, that's because they didn't make the case. I mean, I've, I've <laughs> always tremendously admired Mario Cuomo. The White House didn't make it. The White House didn't make the case. Mario Cuomo, uh, your former, I don't know, do you like him? I thought he was a great guy. I saw him give a speech one time about his opposition to the death penalty. And that was back in the 80s when America was very pro-death penalty and it was not a vote winner, we thought, to say you were opposed to it. But he was passionate, he was absolutely committed, and he had an alternative, I don't really agree with, but it was his alternative, which was life without parole. And he would always make that case. And people respected him for that. And he got re-elected three times. He lost the fourth time. But you, know, you can do that. And the problem I think we come back to is when you mortgage your principles for the sake of reaching consensus, real principles, then you lose. Of course you do. And I think he did that. But I think we've spent a lot of time on this. Can we talk a bit about the current problem in Bagram? Bagram. No, so it's because quite frankly, my interest here is motivating people here to uh, change that. Uh, there are 198 people in Guantanamo, as I said. And any guesses of how many people he knows, I'm sure, how many people, according to the US administration, are in Bagram at the moment? Claire, what do you think? You work in our office. No, come on. Okay. There are a bunch of them. Is it um, more than 300, do you think? Yeah. I mean, the. the, the so, so 5,000, there we go. Slightly fewer than that. I mean, the, the, the figure, according to the US administration, is 645. And in fact, um, as of two days ago, you know this, don't you? They've released the names. I've of, got the names. Of They're all the people in, the names, in Guantanamo. So um, has that changed um, in, in terms of uh, where we are with Bagram? Well, this is your problem, isn't it? And this is the And, and for, for those who don't know, we should have explained, Bagram, of course, um, is, is the prison in Afghanistan. Bagram Theater Detention Facility. Um, the in, in, no, internment. Look, Bagram is Guantanamo's evil twin. And you know, your problem, one reason I don't agree with the gentleman who is espousing very right wing views for left wing reasons over there um, is that we need to close Guantanamo so everyone can focus on the next issue, which is Bagram. And in Bagram um, BTIF, the prisoners there uh, have no, they, they have fewer rights than Guantanamo Bay. You know, they just created a new thing called the Detainee Review Board, which was meant to be the new Obama-improved uh, combatant status review tribunal that they have in Guantanamo. It's got fewer rights than the prisoner in Guantanamo Bay has. The and reason why they do, according to, to put the um, Obama administration's viewpoint, is that um, 
the difference between Guantanamo and Bagram is that Bagram is in an active theater of war. And at never in American, America's history have federal courts granted judicial review of military detention in an active theater of war. It's a distant and active war zone. And whereas the reason after all the long battles in the courts in America that um, judicial right. review yeah, 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 yeah. Was, was allowed for Guantanamo was You've that said enough of that bullshit. Was that because the, 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 the Supreme Court said that um, it was a unique case and it wasn't in a war zone? Okay, let's have a vote. Is the United Arab Emirates in a war zone at the moment? Yes or no? Put your hand up if you think it is. Is Malaysia in a war zone at the moment vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States? Uh, closer call is Pakistan in a war zone right now. You might think it is one or two people. Censor. All the people we represent in, in the Makala case, or the, the, and by we I mean the lawyers involved in this, weren't in Afghanistan. They were taken to Afghanistan by the United States, from the United Arab, Arab Emirates, from Malaysia, from Thailand, from Pakistan. And the notion that you can say that we shouldn't give these people legal rights because we took them to Bagram, when, by the way, the Geneva Conventions say right there that when you have a prisoner of war, you have to take them out of the war zone, is ridiculous. It's not even worth discussing. And yet it's very little known. And, and that's our problem, right? That they say this stuff, which is just nonsensical, uh, and it just doesn't stack up to the prisoners who are there. And, and it, it gets far worse when we get to the British involvement, of course. Have you been to Bagram? No, I haven't been to Bagram. I, I go where my wife allows me to go, and I haven't yet been given permission. But also, the Americans are I was going to say, they've the, the, got two obstacles. You've got Emily, um, who might not give you permission, your wife. Right, but, and the but, Americans. But also. what about the Americans? Will they give you permission? No, they wouldn't, sadly. But we're trying to, and we will get in there eventually. And have any lawyers been allowed no, in no. into Bagram? These tossing softball questions here. No, no lawyers have been allowed there. It is a legal black hole. And I've explained some of the reasons what, that's uh, been given in court by the administration. But I mean, what, what reasons are given to you? Well, it, it is exactly what you say, is that they make this argument that we can't afford to give people legal rights, and yet it's nonsense, isn't it? What you can't afford to do is not give them legal rights for, for several reasons. One is, I got an um, email a while back, it was about a year ago now, from a guy called, if you'll believe it, Captain Kirk. It's actually his real name. His name's Captain Kirk Black. And he said in this email that he and I had met in Guantanamo Bay. He was now stationed in Afghanistan. And he was annoyed at what was going on there. And he, he had discovered this guy who was banged up in Bagram. And would we represent him to get him out? Because he was convinced the guy was innocent. And you know, I naturally assumed this was a CIA sting and I was going to get locked up for it. But when I worked out who this guy was, and he was someone I'd met actually in Binyam's case in Guantanamo, then I replied, and I said, of course, we'll, we'll represent him. He then, to his immense credit, went out and got affidavits from people about how this guy Gul Khan was innocent and had been mistaken for a Taliban leader called Kari Idris. Uh, and then he and I were corresponding, and I said, look, you know, Kirk, you were going to get in terrible trouble. There's no good deed goes unpunished, and you're going to get in trouble for this. And he said, I don't care. And he's a SWAT team officer from Baltimore who, paradoxically, has never watched the war, although he's in it. Um, and he, he said he was tremendous. And he said, I don't care. This is just the right thing to do. So sure enough, he did get in trouble. But in the meantime, we had developed a pilot program, which we proposed to the US military, which was that someone like Kirk, or Kirk himself, would go around to the various you know, local council meetings in Afghanistan ask them if they had problems with an injustice, say, we're here to try and bring justice to Afghanistan. If you've got a problem, you give us the facts. We'll investigate them. We'll report back to Bagram and uh, hopefully get justice for the guy. We proposed this as a pilot project. And this was back in February 2009. And his superior officers thought it was a great idea. Their words were, this will make American troops safer. Um, I had an in with the White House counsel at the time through a friend of mine, so we proposed it to the White House saying, Who's look. Who has since lost his job, but no well, we won't name perhaps. names. But the, uh, but the bottom line is, we said, you know, here's a proposal that'll really make you people look good. It'll be a break from the past. It'll make American soldiers safer. Why don't we do it? Didn't hear back from them. And, and you know, there's a vague underlying threat, which is if you don't do that, we'll sue you bastards and make you look horrible. And we'll begin in the New York Times. 
So we, we, they, we couldn't get them to respond. We did begin in the New York Times with an article that said, Captain Kirk Black, hero in Afghanistan. Uh, that didn't get them to change. So we were preparing to file the lawsuit all the time, talking to the White House. Um, and it was actually my colleague who was on the way to court to file the lawsuit. I uh, got a call from the White House saying, please don't do this. We'll let him go tomorrow. And they did let Gul Khan go tomorrow, which was good for Gul Khan. Uh, but there were a couple of footnotes to that. One is, of course, they didn't resolve the real issue, and they didn't deal with the other 650-odd people in, in Bagram. But the second is that actually, you know, when they took Captain Black aside, the PR people did and said, you shouldn't have done that. You know, they threatened to cashier him, and he said, bring it on. Give me an open court martial, and we'll hear this publicly, whereupon they backed off. But then they took him aside to tick him off and say, you shouldn't have done this. And they said, you know, you were totally wrong about that Gul Khan. We never thought he was Kari Idris. We always knew he was innocent. Um, and you know, we never thought for one minute that he was this Taliban guy. To which Captain Black reasonably replied, why do you hold him for a year? You know, the, the guy they say they were after, they let go three days later, who they say was the bad dude in this. You know, that cannot be the truth. And if it is, if it is the truth, it's just an illustration that they got it even more wrong. So you know, here's an example. And I can give you several others, and I would be glad to, about what's happening in Bagram that's insanity. And yet, if they did the right thing, if I feel sure, if Obama stood by his principles, uh, that he would do the right thing. And one reason he doesn't is the old Australian saying that he never gets the long brown envelope of home truth delivered to him, which I'm sure you've all heard. So the Clive Stafford Smith report card on Obama, certainly on Guantanamo and Bagram is pretty negative, and we haven't even got no, on no, to. No, Guantanamo is not so bad. He's not. He's tried. It's not entirely his fault. He just, and he did much better on the economy. Let's face it. That's the bit I would. And, and we haven't even got on to uh, military commissions and renditions. But I think I know there's people who are anxious to ask some questions. So by all means, ask about those. Um, if we have, if, if you ask questions, can you say who you are first? And if you're from any organi organisation, tell us that as well. So uh, who wants? Um, who wants to? I know there's a gentleman here. Um, can you, wait, you can, can you wait for identify the yourself by state? You and I took on Mark Reagan the, the press just, just wait for the no, microphone right. if you if you, do, if you will. Did, 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 if you just wait for the microphone, sorry. Loud voice. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you a holistic question. Whenever, whenever I see a title which focuses on one camp or one prison or whatever, um, I'm concerned about the stupidity that we have as Americans, uh, which you've said several times, about the holistic view. Um, about two months after t uh, t uh, 2001, um, Wesley Clark, who we should be liking more than other generals, was in the New York Times saying, it's very easy to fight uh, asymmetrical warfare. You um, essentially, it's a cellular structure. You have to pick people out, and you have maybe 28 or 48 hours to question them very severely and find out who their connections are before they disappear. And that was more or less a prescription that the, Algerian, the French had in Algeria with Massou. And about a week or two later, there was somebody in the New York Times saying, well, of course, we have all these uh, terrible laws in America that prohibit us from doing this, but there are other countries that don't. Uh, as the head of Reprieve, looking at this holistically, isn't it possible that Bagram and all of these prison camps are part of a large system in which these interrogations are held uh, uh, under those kind of conditions? I mean, I'm, I, it seems to me that if you look at the, you know, the renditions and everything else, that we are actually trying to track down cellular structures and interrogate people very quickly to find out who their connections are. Well, I mean, I would, I would think there are a couple of things that, that are significant there. One is, um, let, let's have a little poll here today. Another to, one. Another poll. Um, and this is a slightly fairer one, because I haven't said horribly prejudicial things beforehand. The, um, this is still pretty unfair. You know where I'm coming from. The, OK, here we are, January the 20th, 2010. Do you think our world is more or less dangerous than when we all watched that movie, The Third World War, about the mutually assured destruction and nuclear holocaust? Who thinks it's more dangerous today than it was back then? OK, who thinks it's less dangerous today than it was back then? And the rest of you have no opinion. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I've got, <laughs> it's the so same. I've got to say, I think people who think it's more dangerous today are crazy. And, and certainly they would be crazy if they looked at it in 2001. Um, if you look, I don't, know, I don't know if you remember that emotional thing where you think about 
those nuclear things soaring over the sky that were going to land on us in really 45 minutes as opposed to the other one, and that we're going to obliterate the entire world. I remember watching that film and being really, really afraid. Whereas, to, you know, the, the thing that really gets me about this whole process, which is very American but is also very universal, is the politics of fear and the politics of hatred. And the fact, I mean, one thing that, just to, anecdotally, I was astounded when the Conservative Party in 97 said on their website that Britain was number one in the Premier League of Crime. I mean, isn't that fascinating? I have been held up seven times at gunpoint. How many people here in Britain can match me? Put your hand up. How many people here have been held up once at gunpoint? One time. You're British. Where was it? No, I'd say no. No, no. The, it wasn't, it wasn't. Where was it? South Africa. South Africa. There you go. And in America? Doing the colonels. Right. So, you know, no, you know what's, isn't that fascinating that a political... You're forgetting climate change, which is what I think I've certainly had my hand on. Well, you may well do. I mean, it's interesting. I, I would dispute with you on that, too, about the notion that the U.S. and the USSR could obliterate us in seconds versus that as a problem. But, you know, I accept your point. But I disagree with it. But, um, but, but in terms of this issue, issue of um, fear, what is it, somebody? Someone tell me, why is it that politicians tell us that we live in such a shitty world, that the place they're running is so crap? Like the, but, but it is true, isn't it? I mean, it's, the, it's much easier to control people through making them afraid of something. And it's the same with the death penalty. We say, you know, we've got a real crime problem in America. Oh, it's a few black people who committed murder. Let's execute them and everything will be fine. None of us believes that. It's a complicated problem that takes complicated solutions, and we need to approach those complicated solutions, or we don't have a chance. And yet we, we, we fall for that stuff all the time, whether it be the people you refer to as stupid Americans or the people we might refer to as not terribly smart British people. That, that unfortunately, is, is true across the board. Now, the question is, how do we respond to that? How do we, as journalists and politicians and other people of any influence, respond to it? And the, there's quite an easy answer to that, isn't there? I mean, it's that actually the news, you media people, you should have a program called The Good News, uh, which is not about the Bible, but about, <laughs> um, but about decent things that go on. We've got, to, we've got to recognize in Britain how lucky you are that you have an NHS and that you actually don't have a crime. There was, there was a well-known BBC newsreader called um, Martin Lewis who, uh, who argued exactly that. And, and Martin uh, was very wise, very, very <laughs> wise guy. But anyway, I mean, the, I, I'm, not sure, I'm, I'm not getting to your question because I'm not sure I quite agree with the premise of your question. I think that, uh, that you know, our, our, it's not just an American problem, that, that you know, we can't just is say... Is there a hidden system? And you said secret before you, so that's the big Well, thing. I mean, and there the, is the second issue that I think really is crucial, which is secrecy. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't buy a lot of the conspiracy theories. But one thing I can tell you as an aphorism for our world is you can't learn from history if you don't know what that history is. How many people here think we should prosecute Cheney, Dick Cheney? Put your hand up. Must get a majority, probably. I don't agree with you, quite frankly. But we need to know what happened, right? And you know, when you look at um, the last eight or nine years, and you know, I find unfathomable the conversations I have with Binyam Mohammed, for example, that the US and British government can get together and say that criminal offenses we committed against Binyam Mohammed, the crime of torture, is somehow um, secret, that it's a threat to national security to reveal that. It is a threat to politicians. It's embarrassing. It's going to get them in trouble. It's a threat to the people who committed the crimes. It's going to get them prosecuted. But it can't be a threat to national security. Right now, Shakarama. How many of you have heard of Shakarama? There is sitting in Washington. He's the last British resident recognized by this country, He's still in Guantanamo. The reason he hasn't been released, according to Harper's Magazine yesterday, is that the Americans are so mortally embarrassed that if he comes back, he'll tell the truth publicly. Well, I'm here to tell you the truth. It's not classified what he's told me. And that's how he was abused. And, and Harper's say that the abuse he described to us in 2006, which we unclassified and filed in court, 
matches the physical injuries on the three people who supposedly committed suicide in Guantanamo Bay, were they murdered? I mean, that's the theory of Harper's. Whether one buys that or not, surely we want to know the truth. Surely we want to know the hundreds of pages that I'm longing to go read that have just been revealed to us in Washington, D.C. through pressure through the British courts that apparently show how Shaka was tortured. I haven't been there. They only just revealed them. I'm going there very soon, and I'll get to read them. It'll be jolly good fun. I'll enjoy myself immensely. You won't hear a word of it, because it'll be classified. How is that? And so what we need... Can before, I just explain sorry. on that? For those who haven't been following that story, you might remember that um, some months ago, uh, it was, what, a year and a half ago? I can't remember now. Um, after long process, courts, the High Court in London um, agreed to release the, all the files on the Bini Mohammed case to help people like Clive and the other solicitors involved um, fight to get him released. Um, and they did, on the condition it wasn't they weren't given to the people like me. Um, <laughs> and, and he so, tried. He tried to get me to violate my security yeah. arrangement. I wouldn't. Several bottles of wine, and it still didn't work. <laughs> um, uh, and, and now on the Shaka Armour case, as of what, as three of days last ago, week, yeah. as of last mm. week, um, the High Court again has agreed for the, the, all the papers which belong to MI5 and, and so on to be released. To him and still wine. Under the aegis still of secrecy. Still the wine isn't working, but. Um. And it's secret and you can't know. But how can that be? This is the crucial thing. I mean, I'm, you know, there is a huge, there's, there's been a big pattern of secret prisons and so on and so forth. What we need to know is we need to know what happened so that next time we panic, and we're going to panic, there'll be another crisis. Next time we panic, we've learned from these mistakes. And that's why I believe not in prosecuting Cheney, much as it would give us some sense of uh, gratification, but in a truth and reconciliation process where we can find out the truth. I don't care if they go to jail. I just don't want it to be repeated. And that's Binyam's view, quite frankly, too. Oh, would you oh, mind? I'm, I'm afraid I've not been well the last few days. Do you mind if I just dash out? You heck on, you, you take the heck are, are you going to come back? I'll be right back. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Unless in my absence you say something really rude. <laughs> I do apologize, but... That's all right. Um, <laughs> I think I said, um, did I say uh, wars of law rather than laws yeah. of war before? Yeah. Um, but we will get, I mean, basically, what, one of the things that the Obama administration um, decided to do, that there was the third group of prisoners from Guantanamo, that, that those who were going to be released um, to countries which would take them around the world. And, and one of the difficulties has been that because of Congress, as um, Clive was saying, because Congress has banned any uh, prisoners from being allowed to be released or to, 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 to even be held in the United States unless they're going to be facing trial. Um, that has put off a lot of countries from actually saying that they will take some of these individuals because they say, well, why should we take these prisoners if you aren't going to take any? So anyway, the, the, the groups are those people who are going to be released, those people who are going to be put on trial either before a federal court or military commissions, because one of the things that has happened over the last year is that a revamped version of the old military commission is going to be continuing. And then the third group are those who aren't going to be released and aren't, aren't going to be put on trial. And those are the people who, um, if I get the words in the right order, are, being, are going to be held under the laws of war. And the argument for that is that um, the United States is at war and that um, in any time of war you're allowed to hold prisoners of war and that their cases will be reviewed regularly by the courts and by the executive, by the president. And um, I think we can guess probably what um, Clive's view is on that, but we'll ask him um, when he gets back. But I was going to open the floor to questions. So um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, um, as um, Julie said, I've just uh, finished um, a documentary which um, you can still download on, online about um, the process of trying to close Guantanamo and I had access to officials in the Obama administration and um, uh, been to Guantanamo and so on. So any questions about the, the process? Can I say one other thing I forgot to say? <laughs> which is, you know, the toilet is always a great place to remember the things, isn't it? And first, I'll give you more information you want to know. I ruptured my, my back lifting little Wilfred up the other day, which has me on some embarrassing medication, that's all. The, uh, that's more than you wanted to know, I know. <laughs> Wilfred's his son, not the one. Wilfred's my little cat. boy. Um, the, 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 the other thing I did but want to say... But they haven't got any questions, by the way, Clive, on, on the process of what's been going on over the last year, so <laughs> you, you talk away. Or on my ruptured, <laughs> what, on my ruptured disc. The, 
the one thing I would beg of you is this. Uh, on this secrecy thing, which I think is, is most important to us in the last while, it's very hard to get people to pay attention. You know, it's very hard for journalists to make it a story because, you know, let's say uh, John wants to do a story on the secret stuff I've seen, and I go up to John, I say, wow, it's really exciting stuff. And he says, oh, great, you know, what is it? I can't tell you. You know, that's actually not a great story, and so it's hard to get people to pay attention to you, but those are the stories that are most important well, to all Those stories have been covered, haven't they? Because um, I, I know we're meant to be talking about the Obama era here, but going back to the time when um, the, the so-called high-value detainees were being held in secret prisons, in the black prisons um, in certain parts of the, of the world. Let me tell you, and we weren't, you and we weren't being tell, told what they were, that the journalists at the BBC and elsewhere were doing stories about, let's take a poll. Not, about not get, getting the answers Let, from Let's the take a poll. Where was Abu Zubaydah held? Put your hand up if you know. You have no idea? Is Abu Zubaydah a member of Al-Qaeda? Yes or no? Come on, put your hand up if you think he is. The Americans say he's number three, or they've said that publicly. Are the Americans today saying in court that Abu Zubaydah is a member of al-Qaeda, yes or no? You have no idea. What's in those materials for Shakarama? You have no idea. I can't tell you. I'm not going to tell you. This is the problem. And that you, you have no concept what the truth is of those things. And yet, isn't that somewhat crucial? I mean, let's hypothesize for a minute that the US is now saying the guy we said was number three in al-Qaeda actually was never a member at all. Let's pretend that's the case. Isn't that something you'd want to know? And how did we waterboard that guy so many times? How did we put him in a coffin with little bugs in it because we knew that he had problems and get him to say lots of things? if we now think that was true. I don't know if that's the case or not. I can't possibly comment. But those are things that you need to know. And you don't know them. And this is horrifying. Some information has come out, though, hasn't a it? Tiny I mean, amount. Some of the CIA files, which we didn't know about this time last year, we now know how many times Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was waterboarded. You know that. I mean, what do you know about, well, whatever. Um, you know, this is a problem, isn't it? And that's what I encourage you to think about, because secrecy, you know, if they say that uh, sunlight is the greatest disinfectant, which is a nice little phrase, then darkness is not a disinfectant, well, and we need to worry about it. We have a question at the back. Again, remember to say yeah, your name, yeah, I'm, please. I'm Fiona Anderson. I work at the BBC's College of Journalism, um, and I've admired your work uh, on death row for a long time. I spent some time in the States doing some very minor stuff on death row, and your work was always the best. So thank you <laughs> yeah. for that. I um, paid her, by the way. This is all yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, look, my question now is, can you walk us through that middle group that you say could end up in US courts? Given the secrecy you're describing, the lack of actual knowledge of fact, how do, we, how do you see those people getting into any sort of US court where they get a fair process? Well, let me, give, let me ask you, don't, don't give up the microphone. Um, look. No, you will have an answer for this. Um, do you remember the spy trials, right? You know, when there would be spies, the Rosenbergs, for example. You remember that we well, probably before, don't. Before my, I, I think before my time, too, let me hasten to that. <laughs> but you've seen the movie, at least. They had trials there, right? How did they deal with the manifestly secret evidence of the US nuclear weapons? held it in camera? Exactly. Yeah. This is nothing new. We've done it for decades. And the concept that you can't have certain things that really are classified in camera, of course you can. We've always done it. And you know, again, I would ask you generally, do you honestly think that evidence of the abuse of Abu Zubaydah, KSM, or whomever, is more a threat to US national security than evidence of how to build a nuclear bomb was? In the, in the 1950s. Of course it's not. So, you know, allowing you a teeny weeny bit of cynicism, why do you think it is that they say they can't try these people? <coughs> I've no idea. Does anyone else like to hazard a guess? Good. Yeah. Perhaps the juries would be prejudicial. In which sense? Does this wait, wait for the microphone if we can? Juries would be prejudiced. <laughs> I mean, something to bear in mind while you're just waiting for the mic, of course, it was announced in November that 10 people are going to be facing trials, um, that there will be more. There's 40 on the list to face trials, although that hasn't been officially announced yet. Um, but five of the, those 10 are going to be facing federal courts in New York. Um, and, and, uh, Which Sheikh was Mohammed. a very positive, sensible decision, notwithstanding what the Republicans and, said about it. 
And so you, your argument is that you I fear that would that. be difficult? I think that's the argument already yeah. about the, the case in New York. Yeah. But if, if, let me ask you this, casting your mind back to the McCarthy era, do you think that Americans were more or less prejudiced against communists who were spies who were betraying America than they are today? They were more prejudiced. Back then. Yeah, so we did it. Anyhow, I mean, I agree with you that, you know, juries in Mississippi were often prejudiced against my client. I was actually picking up a jury in, in Louisiana, and this was a terrible mistake I made. It was in Scotty Lloyd's case. And I, I was having fun, actually. And I was getting, you know, you get to voir dire the jurors and ask them lots of questions. And out of 171 people, I got 126 to tell me that they thought Scotty should be executed without a trial. And, you know, I was jolly because I was getting them all kicked off the jury left, right, and center. Poor old Scotty. I'd forgotten about, you know, how he must take it, poor guy. This guy was sitting next to me listening to 126 people say they'd kill him without a trial, and it was pretty tragic. Uh, and it really devastated him psychologically, and that was a big mistake on my part. But the truth is there's a lot of prejudice out there about a lot of people, and we can deal with that. The way we dealt with that there was we, you know, we got rid of the whole jury and we started again somewhere better. You're right, it's difficult to find Americans who are not prejudiced, but we could. We could find them. We'd pick these guys over here, probably commie pinko <laughs> liberals, and uh, give us a fair trial and think there was a conspiracy going on with the government, and you know, we'd be okay. Zacharias Massawi, supposedly the 20th hijacker, didn't get the death penalty. That's a fairly impressive commentary on the American judicial system in a way. When you popped out just before, I was explaining about that third group, not the wars of law, but the laws of war, um, uh, de detainees as, they, as they're described, and that, that's the group, as you know, who aren't going to face trial, aren't going to be released because they say that um, uh, they, 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 wouldn't, they are dangerous but they can't have trials. And I'm not, not going to ask you whether that's a good thing or a bad thing because I know what you can say to that. But if in November 2008 you knew that um, that was going to be the case under a President Obama, would you have voted for him? Yeah, of course I would. What was the alternative, for goodness sake? But, um, and yeah, what's the and, and I, mean, uh, I have some sympathy with Obama, don't you? I mean, he's dealing, we have to remember, with the slate of problems that he got handed as a president and, uh, and what he had to deal with. And there were much bigger problems in many ways than the problems that obsess me. I mean, you know, you look at the, the economy, you look at the, the health service and so forth. Those were very difficult things. And I think we're focusing on some areas that he, he's not done terribly well on. But, you know, let's face it, if I had to vote for him or against the guy who won the Senate of vote in, New York, in uh, Massachusetts yesterday, former nude male model of the Republican Party, I'd vote for Obama. So you, you, you've spent many hours of airtime and, and, and newspaper columns arguing against military commissions. We know, we know that military commissions, albeit revamped, are going to be continuing. Well, you know, military commissions are a lawyer's wet dream. I mean, you know, I was having so much fun in Guantanamo of the military commissions. The uh, I won't bore you with the details, but someone has dragged copies of the book I wrote, which includes a lot on it here. If you want to make a defense lawyer very, very happy, uh, what you do is you say to yourself, ah, we've had a constitution for 220, 230, 20 years now, and we still can't figure out how to do a death penalty case. They still get us reversed all the time. So instead of following the tried and true method that we lose most of the time anyhow, let's create something out of whole cloth and give the defense lawyers issues they can argue about for the next 40 years. You know, if that's what you want to do, be my guest. And, you know, I, it's great fun. And in Binyam's case, we never got beyond the very first issue, which was whether he could, they could spell his name properly, which they couldn't. It was tremendous fun just arguing about that for six hours. But, you know, I, I think it's fun from a defense lawyer's perspective. It's crazy from a societal perspective. And we must never let the lawyer's dreams run the way a sensible society should run. So I oppose the military commissions, not because I think they're bad for my clients. I think they're wonderful. We'd have a tremendous time on them. But because they're crazy. And they're bad for America's reput reputation, because we have a judicial system that works quite well within its limits. And if we create a new thing that has, you know, for example. The administration, of course, argues that it's not a new thing. That's been a long history of well, military Well, let me tell you, there is, there is no case history. in the history of the world 
that establishes that there's a war crime called conspiracy. There's no case in the history of the world that says there's a war crime called terrorism. Those are two things made up out of whole cloth by the Bush administration. Every single prisoner in Guantanamo who has so far been charged has been charged with conspiracy and to commit terrorism. And it's two an interesting, crimes that don't exist. Interesting footnote to that in that the Obama administration attempted to remove those two parts of uh, of, the, of the military commission so that you couldn't be charged with conspiracy but that was reversed as I understand it in Congress and so that is part of the new revamped military commission so that basically means that um, you can be charged under federal law w with conspiracy to commit a, an act of terrorism but you can also be charged under military commissions with that offence and an argument which has been put forward by people who don't think military commissions are a good idea is that um, <coughs> the authorities will choose the military commissions because they will believe it's easier to secure a conviction there. Which and, and easier to cover up the evidence of, of torture, but that's true. There must be some more questions. People must be dying to ask questions. The guy and gentleman, again, again we'll wait for the, um, for the microphone and, and would you hold it close to your mouth as well? Please? Is that close enough? That's perfect. Uh, my name's Ed Clark. I'm a photographer working on a book about Guantanamo. Um, as well as saying he's going to close Guantanamo, Obama said he's going to close the black sites as well. Um, do you think he has done that? These are the sites which are run by the C were run by the CIA for torture. Um, and do you think the secret prisons, as opposed to the black sites, are still operating? Are there still people being rendered to the secret prisons? by the Americans. How many people here think that there is no longer a secret prison in operation by the United States today? Put your hand up. Oh, come on. There must be some of you. You say it, sir, just to be contrary. <laughs> no. No. I mean, look, of course they have. How many people do think? How many are? people think there are secret okay. prisons? How many people have no opinion? Third opinion. I, I spoke to Steve Rapp. Yeah, there's again, uh, so if you just, just sorry, wait, 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 for, wait for the microphone. Keeping the uh, microphone people fit. Um, well, I spoke to Steve Rapp, who is Obama's ambassador to war on um, war criminals, um, uh, two days ago. And he said, first of Can all, you, uh, people at the back can't hear you. If you just hold the microphone. He said, first of all, you're the, not saying uh, speaking as loudly as a loud American <laughs> should, as you promised. I'm very proud of my loud voice. <laughs> Um, he said that actually they're already talking to the ICC and they probably will ev eventually uh, come to an agreement with him. And he also made the claim publicly that America was not breaking any of its laws any longer. And I, I, this is why I asked my first question. If you don't know whether there's this internal conspiracy, secret conspiracy, how do you know it's stopped? It's not a conspiracy. I mean, we all know it's happening. Look, it, there, what I love about this stuff, which I found so fascinating over the far, past few years, is how predictable it is, how logic tells you what's happening. So for example, Guantanamo Bay, you can analyze that and you say, why did they choose Guantanamo Bay? Because it's not American territory that is totally under control of the US, is miles away from annoying media and lawyers, and that they can argue that these people have no legal rights. That's obviously why they chose it. We know that's why. They've said it. Where's the next place? You know they were going to use. I mean, it's just blindingly obvious. It's Diego Garcia. You know that, right? I mean, it's obvious. And much as they denied it 54 times, by the way, the British finally admitted two people were rendered through there, and we have evidence of far more than that, which is gradually going to come out. Um, you just know this because it's logic, and you, you're sitting there thinking, what would they do? Yes, that's what they do. Yes, almost certainly that's what they did. <clears throat> now here, there's, it's much more obvious. We have two ongoing wars uh, that are recognized. That's Iraq and Afghanistan. There's Somalia that's going on as well, and all sorts of other things going on in other places like Yemen. Um, there are prisoners being taken in, if not Afghanistan, UAE, Pakistan, Malaysia, and Thailand. You know this is happening. Where are those people? There are 35 people today recognized as foreign nationals, non-Afghan nationals, in Bagram Air Force Base. We can tell you who almost all of them are, not all of them, but they've been there for years and years. Who are the new people that they're grabbing, and what are they doing with them? And there are only two possible hypotheses, right? One is that the Americans or someone's grabbing them and then immediately turning them over to some proxy detention group and then interrogating them there, as happened with Binyam Mohammed, for example, or with many other people. And the other is that, for example, when we say that we're going to turn Bagram over to the Afghans, that actually there's a part of Bagram 
that the ICRC is not going to. Well, I can tell you for a fact that's true, that there's a part of Bagram that the ICRC is not able to get to. You know it as a matter of logic, but I can tell you as a matter of fact. Now, how is it that the US can say with a straight face that we are no longer violating our laws? When a, name me a law that says we can't hold foreigners in a place, some dark hole in Afghanistan. Name me a law. Precisely. Well, I mean, also Syria. Egypt. But can you name me one? No, no, no. no of course there's, there's no universal there is no jurisdiction. Law. I'm conscious that other people, other people want to ask questions. I mean, just as this is part of that, um, you mentioned the word rendition. Um, another task force, which was set up as part of the process we talked at, about at the beginning, <laughs> ruled in August that rendition could continue. So that that, that is. Allowed. But I think but it's important just when you're looking at this, and when you're looking at this skeptically, you know. And I don't mean that you're saying, "Oh, what a bunch of bastards." You're just saying. How can they say that and yet what they say is technically true but they're still doing what we think they're doing? You know, one thing I enjoyed doing in Guantanamo was going through all of those things. When they said, and actually the quote I have is from a guy called Manel uh, in uh, January 04 where Lieutenant well done, Colonel Burfiend oh, yeah. said to you, and it's quoted, it's quoted in my book on whatever page, at, from January 24th, 2004. There are no juveniles in Guantanamo Bay. I, I hear that when John has it on his program. I say, you've got to be kidding me. I'm representing half a dozen. How can they say that? And it came out two years later that the reason they could say that was they had redefined the term juvenile. So instead of accepting what the UN, the US Supreme Court, and everyone else says, the military was saying that in order to be a juvenile today, you have to be under 16, as opposed to the law that says at the time you were arrested, you have to, or you committed the crime, you have to be under 18. They'd redefined the term. How can you know, so there's a whole series of that. And so I, I really enjoyed getting into this because it was sort of funny, but it's also depressing. And unfortunately, what we see in all these public statements is, is uh, the uh, elastic use of the language. And they, they did have a prison uh, camp called Camp Iguano, which I visited in Guantanamo, where they were holding people under the age of um, 18. Um, I think under the age of 16. 16 and 15 year olds, I think, were there right, or, were when there. I, I was there. But um, more questions. Um, uh, uh, let's get the microphone sorry. Back, to, back to this gentleman. Do you still, does, does, do you um, sites which are yeah, run I told you. By yes, the there CIA. is. I know, I know where one is. Right, but and it's not so damn secret. Putting but Bagram to one side and Diego Garcia, are there other sites around the world which are controlled by the CIA where rendition and interrogation is going on? Well, my uh, clairvoyance only goes so far, Ed. Um, but I do. Th I think there are. I'm not certain of this, but I would be quite surprised if there are prisoners not being held in Camp Le Manier in in uh, Djibouti because we've had lots of information on that and it makes sense. I mean, if you were grabbing people in Somalia, what would you do with them? Um, there, are, there are many, many more proxy places. We've had information about Mauritania as an American prison, about Morocco as having a CIA prison. Some of these I can't prove, but I think there's some logic that tells you why they might use those countries. And then the bigger issue is, I think that people are hold, being held for a while and there is a lot more turning them back over to their own countries to disappear them effectively, whether that be um, you know Jordan, which has been used a great deal, uh, Syria, fascinatingly, Egypt, Morocco, and so forth. Uh, those are, you know we don't know we know a lot about those, but we don't know we, there's a lot more we don't know than we do know, and that's why we need to expose the truth in the long term. It's shocking that we as Americans are consorting with those people to not just render people in violation of the Refugee and Torture Convention, but actually consort to, to, to make that happen in the longer term. It's terrible. Quite a few hands went up, went up before. Who else wants to ask a question in the time we've got left? Come on. There were a few, quite a few hands before. And the time is whatever you want, although the, the, if you have to go, please don't the lady, rude. The lady at the back. Um, earlier on, you mentioned Bagram and wanting to raise awareness about Bagram. But what can we do? I mean, what what would what it, would it be helpful for us oh, to try good. to do about? It? What a good question. What do you do, ma'am? I oh, know. Leave the microphone with her. <laughs> what do you do? 
I'm not a lawyer, you know. It doesn't just... matter. Lawyers are sociopaths. There was a study done in California <laughs> that the three groups of Americans who come out high on the 4-9 scale of the MMPR, as in antisocial personality disorders, disorder, are doctors, lawyers, and mass murderers. So you should be glad you're not a lawyer. Now, let's, let's go forward. All right. Well, I'm a, campa I'm a campaigner, but I'm a health campaigner. So what I do right. is I get people to, to write to people. I get people to go along. I get people to campaign. But I don't really know where the levers of power are on this how to make things change? Well, I tell you, I mean, there are, we can't go on forever on it, but let me just put out a few rules. One is the problem with the left is they take themselves too seriously, and it's not very persuasive. What you've got to do is figure out ways to make people laugh at this amazing folly, which is what I loved about the Fair Trial My Ass campaign, because it was fun, and uh, it made people <coughs> laugh at George Bush. I, one of the things I want to do right now it, and we're, we're working on this is on the whole torture by music business because still there's all these enhanced interrogation technique things and uh, and you know Binyam Mohammed said he'd far rather have the razor blade taken to his genitals than have loud music played at him and he wasn't even talking about country western and the reason for that in all serious and by the way I mean poll poll here how many people would rather have a razor blade to their genitals put your hand up you can't say nothing. You don't get to not take an opinion, sir. I'm afraid you have to know. Your choice is razor blade to the genitals versus loud music blasted uh, at you. Loud music. Loud music. How many people are with this gentleman? Loud music. How many people go with a razor blade to the genitals? Let me, let me, oh, Lord, I know you two. How about you, ma'am? Pass the microphone. Will you explain, will you explain your position? What, one's a local pain and one's completely enveloping. And completely what? Enveloping. And what does it do to you? Why, why, I'd go mad much quicker. Well, it's interesting. Binyam and Mohammed, who's one of the few experts out there, because he had both of it done to him, says that you're right, ma'am. And the reason he says this is this. He says, you know, physical pain, you know it's coming, you know it's going to end. It's horrid. But you know that. Mental pain, you begin to lose your mind. And the way he would put it is this. And we'll have another poll here. I'm going to give you the choice. Uh, would you rather lose your sight, as in be blinded, or would you rather lose your mind, as in go insane? Put your hand up if you'd rather lose your sight, which is terrible, right? How many people would rather go insane? <coughs> oh, yeah, there we go. And why is that, you two? Well, you would know you're insane. I assumed you were going to say that you feel you're nine-tenths of the way already. But <laughs> it, no, but it, all, joking, all joking aside, what that illustrates is the insidious quality of these latter-day techniques, right? And so to, to get back to your question, ma'am, at the back, <clears throat> we need to figure out ways that we remind people of this and make them think about it. And so one of the things we've been doing at Reprieve, for example, is trying to get bands to sign up to my, well, one or two of them are my stupid ideas, one or two of other people's not quite so stupid. I want to put out an album that is, now that's what I call torture. Uh, I'd, I'd like to, I want the BBC for Desert Island Discs to do a spoof of Donald Rumsfeld's eight torture music, whatever things, you know, what he'd use in Guantanamo, and so forth, to take the mickey out of them so that people, so it becomes newsworthy again, so people think about it, so they don't do it again. And we've got endless things like that, which don't require a law degree, they require a fertile imagination and the desire to do it. So we can talk about that more afterwards uh, over a drink. And just to underline the point you were making about the effect of um, that kind of, um, in, in, of, of, of torture, um, when I interviewed Binyam Mohammed, as you know, um, last year, um, he, um, in a way, probably because it was still fresh in his memory, just come back from Guantanamo, he glossed over the what happened to him in Morocco, but when he talked about the dark prison in Afghanistan, where he was um, subjected to what Clive has just described, he said, compared to that, Guantanamo was a five-star hotel. So I think that mm. probably under underlines that. More, more <coughs> questions, come on, let, you're not a shy lot. There must be uh, some things people have been dying to ask Clive. <laughs> or a comment you'd like to make. At the, um, yes. at the back, Amy. Hi, John. <laughs> um, I work at the BBC as well. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned earlier that um, America won't take any of the people they're sending home from Guantanamo, but they want other countries to take them. 
how do they justify that? I should know this, but I don't. Well, it's, it's a very good question. You know, why won't America take people and how can they expect other countries to if they won't? But they don't just, yeah. Can I butt, butt in on that sure, one? Of There's a guy called Daniel Freed, who's the US special envoy um, for the closure, closure of Guantanamo. He works in the State Department. And I asked him that, exactly the same question um, uh, in September. And he said, I'm not going to criticize Congress, but it's a fact that as a result of the fact that the United States won't take any of these individuals, it is making my, my job as the special envoy harder. Um, and he admitted that there were governments around the world who, which, who were saying to him, why should we take any of these prisoners if you, are, you aren't going to? And he said that if some had been allowed into America, the governments he was negotiating with would have taken would have taken more and and one one of i mean do you think that if america before congress got involved and started opposing the obama plans if right at the beginning in, in february and march last year the uh, the obama administration had brought some of the uyghurs they, they, those are the um, a minority from northwest china who are being held in Guantanamo and who the Supreme Court said should not, not have been there. Um, there were plans to bring those Uyghurs, to North, some of them, to North Virginia, where there's a Uyghur population. And as soon as the um, political opposition built up, that became impossible. Do you think if they had, that, that, that had happened right at the beginning, going back to plan rather than process, then the whole history of the last few months could have been different? If they had done that, I mean, look, it was clearly the right thing to do at the very beginning. You know, one of the th we found it a lot easier to deal with the Uyghurs in America than others because there was a Chinese expat community who said, we hate the communists. And, and you know, they were very, very strong in support of the Uyghurs who were never enemies of America. They loved America. And they were nauseatingly patriotic about America when we first meet them. If they'd been moved to North, Virgi North Virginia, for example, with a real PR job where you have all these Chinese Americans say, well, thank goodness we're letting these people come to this country. They're refugees from the perfidious communists and so on and so forth. They could have got away with that and that would have immediately created the environment to make it much easier to take people elsewhere. You know, that's much easier for us to say now than it was perhaps to do it at the very first day. But they should have done that. And, and we've now got real problems. And your question is a very good one. I've got to do a thing next week, actually, with Daniel Fried in Belgium, where he and I, I hope, are going to be extraordinary buddies, because we're totally on the same, same side. I feel so sorry for the guy. He's trying so hard to get these refugees a place to go to. And he's up against a lot of totally rational, sensible um, complaints from the Europeans, which is not just why should we do it if America doesn't do it, but why should we take these people who President George Bush said are terribly wicked, evil people? I mean, it's so difficult. Um, and you know, one of the terrible problems, which is not a secret, is when Binyam Mohammed came back and Obama let him go immediately that he took office. And there was an agreement, I, I suspect, between the British and the Americans that the Americans wouldn't brief against uh, Binyam. You know, they wouldn't, when the British have kindly taken him back, the American Pentagon wouldn't the next day say, this guy's a lunatic who wanted to blow up New York and you people are all in great danger. Because, you know, what sort of a stupid thing would that be for the Pentagon to say? Well, what did they do? They did exactly that. I mean, I'd actually threatened them with defamation litigation if they did it just to try and shut them up because it's patently false and Binyam has never caused any trouble and he's now happily married to a woman from the Channel Islands and that's great. Um, but, you know, they did these things. The, 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 the right wing in America, like Cheney and, and the Pentagon, have done these things to make Obama's job so much more difficult. But we've got to rise above that and, we've got, and, and there's a way to do that. And that is that um, taking prisoners from Guantanamo makes a European country safer. That is self-evidently the case. If, if you, as a European country, say, well, we think this was a horrible mistake in Guantanamo, and notwithstanding what everyone else says, we're going to take these people in as refugees, as Portugal has, then it makes it way less likely that you are going to be the object of an assault by you know, whomever the latest extremist nutcase is. And indeed, the Taliban, I was proud to say, 
said that what Portugal did was a good positive thing. And I think that's wonderful, because Portugal got good PR from the Taliban for doing the right thing. And actually, doing the right thing here makes Europe safer. I don't think America's going to get safer, because the nutcases there still won't do it. But it'd make us safer. And that's the message we've got to get across. But it's a tough sell. We've got to do it. Sorry, yes. That's all right. Yeah. So I have another question there. Just referring back to the loud music story, and then your reference. Do you want a microphone? I'm sorry. I have, I have got a microphone. Oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. Just re referencing the loud music and your um, story about lunatics. I mean, um, you know, one of the things I've heard is that you know they really have mentally destabilised a number of these uh, inmates, and so that they really aren't fit for release. Um, and I don't know if that's uh, what you can tell us about that, or whether or not they would need to go into special facilities and, and have lost their reason. Well, let's take Binyam, for example, and I don't want to talk about real privacy issues, so I'll talk in general out generalities. Binyam is a torture victim. There's no two ways about it. And uh, you know, anyone, and I know that John would be a witness to this, anyone who starts talking to him um, about certain things in certain ways is going to spark him off. Not that he starts frothing at the mouth and assaulting you, but it just he sh totally shuts down to the world because of what he's been through. And he undoubtedly suffers. He undoubtedly will suffer forever. Our job is to get him the help he needs, and we're trying to do that. Um, so yes, there are people who are absolutely scarred by the whole process. But I guess the underlying question that you're asking is, have we, again, now abused these people so much that not only might some people hate America, but we've made people so mentally ill that we can't afford to release them. Well, again, I think to pose the question is to answer it, that the fact that we have abused them so much means we owe them something, not that we owe them a life in prison without a trial. So I think that we'd all agree on that. I, I know that there is the practicalities of what the National Enquirer would say, but, uh, but I think civilized people would agree. Well, I think there's a difference between traumatized, I mean, you know, obviously any torture victim, and these are very extreme cases, but, you know, some people have been Actually, quite common cases, sadly. Mm. Um, you know, but truly unable to cope and uh, needing psyche, you know, proper institutionalization immediately. Um, I mean, is that a fact that we should, is that kind of... Well, I think, well, you know, we have to take that on board. It's been much easier for us with our clients who have come back to Europe to get them the help they needed than it is, for example, with one prisoner I represented who was bipolar before he went there, um, who, <laughs> it's funny really, but it's sad. Um, this was a guy who the Americans were convinced was the general of Al-Qaeda. And it turned out ultimately that the reason they said that was when he had a psychotic break in Guantanamo, he said he was the general. They asked him, do you know bin Laden? He says, oh, I am the general of al-Qaeda. I'm his superior officer. In the next sentence, he said, there's a very large snowball that's going to envelop the earth next week. You should warn your families. But you know, it is an illustration of the bizarre world we live in, that it was the general bit that became their, uh, they really believed that. And we were able to prove ultimately that he was a cook. And there was this nice story about the cook who became the general and so forth. His problem is when he went back to Morocco, there were no social services. And you know, it's been very difficult to get him the help he needs. He's done better than one might hope. He's written a book in Arabic, which I hope one day we'll get in English. And he's a very eloquent guy in many ways. And, 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 and it should be said that there are medical foundations here in the UK who have done a lot of work with some of the individuals who have come back to this country but from Guantanamo. Way too few. And I mean, one thing the US should do is at least let us win compensation for people who need it so that they can get the help they need. Uh, that would make sense from the American perspective. But it is another issue that we've not had any uh, good fortune on that, and the Obama administration has um, forcefully resisted any notion that even if we all agree someone was innocent, they should be paid compensation. Before we begin to sum up and make predictions for what's going to happen next, last chance for some questions. There must be some more this gentleman here. Let, let's have, I think, a couple of hands there. So let's have uh, uh, two or three quick questions and some quick answers, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. As the CIA uh, or the um, MI5, MI6 admitted to uh, extraordinary rendition? Well, I mean, I don't think anyone's made an, a formal admission to extraordinary rendition, except that the US has said it's still their policy. So for example, with Binyam Mohammed, notwithstanding everything I have seen in his case, I think I can legitimately say that I've never, ever seen an admission by the US as to where he was for two years. And that's bizarre in a sort of Soviet gulag way. 
that a country would hold someone for all those years and not admit where he was. So they've never admitted officially they rendered him. They've never admitted he was in Morocco and so forth. So I think probably the answer to your question is a mixed. Uh, it's not quite clear. And of course, there is a M Met police investigation, so maybe we'll find out more if that well, no comes. No sane person thinks if that comes he wasn't to court. in Morocco. Um, quick question here. Um, just a really quick question. Um, it's not on Guantanamo, but I just wondered what your views were on the developments in the UK courts over the last few years where Iraqi nationals have been able to use our commitment to the ECHR and the Human Rights Act to challenge their detention and make allegations of ill treatment at the hands of British troops. And what you thought of that, whether that was a move towards what you would view as transparency or? Well, it's a step in the right direction. Let me, let me tell you a very, very important principle that I explain laboriously to all my clients in Guantanamo and the various bad French and Italian that I have to use sometimes. It's the charge of the light brigade theory, which is that when the guns are right in front of you, what you don't do is you don't charge straight at them. You run around the back and you come sneaking up from behind. That's been, I mean, to take what you're saying a step further, in our litigation in Guantanamo cases, we've been suing them in the British courts more often in many ways than the American courts. And as John mentioned, we've got two British courts so far to order the release of secret material that the Americans would never give us in America, even though the courts have ordered the release of exculpatory material. So we had not seen one iota of the stuff on Binyam Mohammed until the British courts ordered it. So I think, you know, one thing that's actually interesting, and we as a nation in Britain, if I speak, may speak schizophrenically, we tend to look at America and we tend then to copy the very worst aspects of America, like scarlet letter law, like all these ridiculous things. Whereas there are very good things about America. I think even my friends over here would concede that we should copy, one of which is the Constitution, for example. I'm not saying that we should have a British Constitution fashioned by uh, some of the people who want to fashion it, but we should, we should have rights, perhaps under the ECHR, that are absolutely enforceable against the whims and passions of today's majoritarian government. So, you know, that's what the law is about. It's, a, it's about protecting weak, powerless people against the populism of the day. And so, yes, the, the, the gradual trend towards enforcing the EC, ECHR is tremendously positive. We have a long, long way to go. It is a, um, it, it's something that bemuses me about those British lawyers, you know, those slightly odd people who wear horsehair wigs and ponce around the way they do, ponce around saying Malad. It's slightly strange <laughs> to me that they still don't recognize that the law is superior to Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair. And that if they do something that violates the individual's rights, we don't care what George Bush says. We sue him and we win. And you know we still haven't established that principle in this country, and we've got to do a lot more of it. And we can learn from America on that. On the other hand, we can use the imperfect institutions of Britain and Europe to enforce a lot of law in America too, which is kind of fun. Was there one last question here? I'm sure I saw one more hand. This gent gentleman here. If you just wait, this will be the last question. If you just wait, sir, for the microphone to get to you. I think the last two people forgot to say who they were. So if you can tell us who you are, please. Um, I'm from uh, I'm from Polish news agency. I just have a quick question. Oh, good. You, Let's talk about Poland. I got lots to say about Poland. Have you Poland. come across any evidence of secret detention camps in Poland and Romania? There is zero doubt that you have had a secret detention camp in Poland. Um, as I feel totally sure you know, we're on to you guys, <laughs> and we've been doing some work on it, and we'd be very happy. No, well, we'll talk to you. We need your help. You know, it's a symbiotic process, media and, and lawyers and other human beings, or human beings. Um, and, and it is that, that, that we work together, right? Because sometimes you journalists can find out things that we can't find out. And sometimes our subpoenas can find out things that you can't find out. So I look forward to talking to you afterwards about how we'd like to work with you on further exposing what we got the goods on you guys in Poland. Don't worry about it. Where else, very quickly, were there secret prisons? Well, Lithuania, Romania, certainly, um, in Europe. And then there are all sorts of interesting things that have not been fully uh, covered in terms of the flights. The flights are so much fun. 
Can I tell you a very quick story? Because it really is entertaining. And it's something you journalists shouldn't do more of. You know, when you've got a CIA plane, right, and we've got 30,000 flight logs of CIA planes, and don't ask me how we got them. It's totally legal. Um, but when you've got those flights and you want to know who's on board, it's quite easy because every time they have one of those flight circuits, they go to Palma de Mallorca or someplace like that for three days. What are they doing there? They're not running a secret prison in Palma de Mallorca. They're having a good time spending my tax dollars on bad champagne. Um, so what you do is you go to the, the airport and you talk nicely to them, and you journalists are good at this, and you get the manifest for the plane that has the names of everyone on the plane. Now, let's have a poll here. How many people think that the operatives on the plane use their real names? Put your hand up. But they don't. You're quite, oh, oh OK. All right, you again. You're, you've got some devious reason for saying that. <laughs> anyway, they don't. And the, you know, one of the ones we've been dealing with, um, of course, the, the pilot calls himself Captain Kirk, as <laughs> one does. You know, James T. Kirk, you are indeed the pilot of the, of the spaceship Enterprise. Well, then what you do is you take that list of names and you go to only the most expensive hotels, because that's how they're going to spend our tax dollars. And, uh, and you talk nicely to them about you know, did Captain Kirk stay in this hotel? And sure enough, he did. It was a Sheraton, typically, in this particular instance. And then you talk nicely to them about, can I please have his uh, hotel records? And because they're nice people, they give them to you. On those hotel records, what do you inevitably find in addition to the bill for Christa, Christabel champagne, if that's right? What do you find? Passport. Now, you don't find the first passport. They've got fake passports. Sorry? Credit card, that's a fake. You know, not that stupid, but they're still stupid. What do they have? Always crazy. Who, what did they do in their hotel rooms when they were lonely and away from home? Different. Telephone calls. They called home. And then there's a nice little program in America, because we don't have this ridiculous DPA, where you, um, you can just look it up and reverse yellow pages, and you find out what their home address is. And then you go take a picture of them outside the house. Um, we've done this a number of times. You, you phoned one of them up, didn't you? Yeah, we went and knocked on the door. Yeah. God, I can show it. Well, normally, I would show a picture of Eric Fain at this point, a rather irate person from North Carolina who was indeed one of the people. This is the sort of fun stuff we can do, and it really is entertaining, and they're not very good at covering their tracks. And you're probably much better at that than, than we are, but I just tell you that story because it's quite entertaining and uh, give you a few ideas. So out there, go and find out more of that. So unless there are any other questions, last chance? No? Um, if we're sitting down here in a year's time when the front line invites us back to do the same again. <laughs> do, do we ever get invited back down? It's unlikely. Mm -hmm. will, will we still be talking about when Guantanamo will close? No, it will close this year. I said that last year and I was wrong. <laughs> I think you said that the year before as well. I said that the year before and I was wrong. But, 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 but seriously, I mean, you know, we, we've talked about the difficulties and, yeah, I think uh, it will. and, and the, the um, number of Democrats in, on Capitol Hill are, well, one fewer than there was this time yesterday. Um, so. And, and they've got this prison in Illinois in which they say they will hold some of them, um, which made a great headline. But um, the bit that, that most of the news reports didn't mention is that they still need Congress to fund that prison because they need to build a fence around it and um, do all the other security stuff and um, make the locals happy. And they need to get all the funding to, to bring prisoners there. And they need Congress <coughs> permission, which is rather unlikely at the moment. So given all these obstacles, especially Congress, it's impossible, isn't it, that it's going to happen within the next year, especially with the midterm elections coming up. And as we said before, senators and congressmen don't want to upset the voters because they might be out of a job. It's tough. It is tough. I mean, they've made their lives much tougher. And the biggest problem is Yemen. I mean, you've still got over 90 prisoners from Yemen. And now that they've bought into this mythological notion that no one can go back to Yemen, and they've said that publicly, they've made their lives much harder. I think it is harder, but, you know, I am. Well, I should say this. When I used to prognosticate about what the Bush people would do, I'd sit back and say, what would I do? What's the sensible thing to do? And I would then say, well, surely they're going to do that. And I was always wrong. So you know, I'm probably wrong here. I still think, as an inveterate optimist, they will close it, because he made it such a big 
issue in his initial statements, and it's become an iconic issue. And there, I are think peop there are people who don't think it will close at all. The reason right. being is if it drags into next year, then we're into the beginnings of the campaign for Obama re-election, and uh, mm. it could be a vote loser. Oh, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. But you, one thing you know is no matter what the votes in America, every day that place stays open makes America less safe. And, uh, you know, that's the great tragedy. That's why we have to work. You know, notwithstanding our criticisms, Europeans have to help shut that place. They have to help Obama do the right thing because he needs that help. Ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation for well, Clive Stephenson.